But now we can talk to one of the biggest names in music who's just started a marathon 96 day tour of the UK. Luton born Paul Young is on the road until November with his Behind the Lens tour, combining behind the scenes stories about his career with stripped back songs. 40 years after the release of his debut album, No Parley, in 1983. And Paul has also published a memoir called Take a Piece of Me with You, and he has a new album coming out next week. Well, he learned to play piano and the guitar when he was young. After he left school, he worked for Vauxhall Motors and he played in various bands at night, the best known being Cat Cool and the Cool Cats, then Street Band and then Q-Tips. But he's enjoyed massive success as a solo singer with 15 top 40 singles and eight top 40 albums. And Paul Young is performing in Wales tonight, but you can see him live in Harpenden next Saturday and then again in Aylesbury on the 19th of May. And he joins us from his hotel room. How are you, Paul? Yeah, I'm fine. Thanks very much. Yeah. Well, this sounds like it's quite a bit of a different kind of Paul Young show, uh, combining stories and the music. Tell us a bit about it, how you formulated it. It's interesting how it came together, because one of the first ones I saw was Martin Kemp went out and he was doing like an interview tour. I thought that was quite an interesting thing to do. And then I went on a 80s cruise a couple of years back in America. It sailed out of Florida, you know, and there are lots of acts on the boat. And part of the thing was you did two, maybe three shows over that weekend, but you were also invited to be interviewed by the MTV VJs, you know, but you do it in front of a live audience. And so I did it. Now, my girlfriend has always said that I'm a natural speaker, you know, so she dragged the manager along. She said, go out and watch this, you know, and it went down really, really well. So then we found a company that does this kind of talking tour, but it also involves a book. So we thought it'd be a really good idea to do it. The book is like my musical journey, but then there's so many things that happen behind the scenes that people only see the show and and then you tell them what happened in the lead up to the show or why it nearly didn't happen or something like that. They obviously don't know these things and it's a bit of an insight. Was it quite fun writing the memoir then? (laughs) <laughs> it was fun in a way because I found a load of photos that I thought I'd lost, you know, from moving house every so often. So I found a lot of photos and I'm really pleased that I did find them. And also it forced me to chronologically log everything. And also I went to lunch a couple of times with my old manager at the time. And it's interesting that I've had to recant these stories so many times. And when I speak to someone else about it, and he said, no, it didn't happen like that. This is what happened, and this is what happened. And I think a manager's probably got a much better idea than an artist has of what happened and when, you know. But you don't have an interviewer or a VJ this time. You're, you're introducing the songs and the stories yourself. Oh, no, no. And most of these ones, they do have a host, but the host is not much more than a prompt. I wanted it to be much more conversational than that. So um, I've got Jamie Moses with me, who's been my guitar player since 1992 in my solo career. And also he was one of the original members of Los Pacaminos and still is when I started them. So so we see each other professionally when I'm doing solo tours and then when we're not doing my solo tours. So he knows me better than most. So tell me about the kind of sound then as you sing, accompanied by him on guitar. This means that all the songs are kind of stripped back a bit, right? Yes, they are. Yeah, yeah. And it's interesting, you know, we started off and we did it with absolutely no other accompaniment at all. And then we thought, but it's so hard to try and do an up-tempo song if it hasn't got some kind of rhythm to it. So in the end, on a couple of them, we have built like a drum track up, especially on the last one, because you want to leave them on and up, you know, so we do come back and stay at the end of the show and it's got a little drum box behind it. Luton Born and Bred, Paul Young here on BBC Three Counties Radio. With the album, the debut solo album for you, No Parley, you had, I think, seven musicians and two backing singers. You know, it was a combination of bass and drums and pianos and synthesizers, a trombone, and you were able to get a trumpet sound and so on. It was a big, full-on production for the majority of those 11 songs. Yeah, it was, and it was the first time I decided to embrace the technology, so there's a lot of synthesizer stuff and drum box, and they're two things that we don't have, so... With the case of something like Love of the Common People, it was written as a country song. So we do it in a kind of country kind of way, but with a slight reggae lilt. 
because we noticed after doing it a few times that some of the girls in the audience were trying to sing the original girl parts. <laughs> <laughs> so we thought, well, we'd better give it that feel, put a little bit of the feel back into it that's a bit more like the record. So we've had to change the songs a little bit to suit two guitars, so it's a new listening experience for them. So how have these early dates of this tour, this marathon tour, gone down, Paul? People are having a lot of fun with it, and there are some amusing anecdotes, you know, where I've, like, I fell off stage in Australia. I was in absolute agony, but still, the tour had to carry on with painkillers and a travelling chiropractor. <laughs> oh, my goodness me, right. I've been through the mill, yeah. Been hurt so much. The Paul Young here on BBC Three Counties Radio. Paul is out on tour. 40 years after the release of his debut solo album, No Parle. You'd been in the band Cat Cool and the Cool Cats and Street Band and Q-Tips. Was your ambition always to be a solo artist? Or were you thinking that if Q-Tips make it a big success, you'd stay with them? Yeah, I would have stayed with Q-Tips, but it's funny having to tell the story over and over again. Either it's I'm getting further from the truth, or what I'm realising is that the Q-Tips had a time limit on them, really, because they were part of a modern resurgence, which lasted a good few years, but then hot on the heels of that came the new romantics and synth-pop duos. And so unless we'd have drastically changed our sound, I don't think we would have survived much longer, to be honest. So when you signed up to CBS Records, and that's a, you know, a massive company, what sort of sound did they want you to have, and did they have a say in that and a say in the material you chose? There was a little bit of a misunderstanding in the beginning. So they were very keen on taking me as a solo artist. And therefore, as I said, it wasn't something I was after, but it was something that was offered. And we tried doing a few different things with Q-Tips. The keyboard player and I became a writing and arranging partnership. And some things, the rest of the Q-Tips liked, and then the other things, they weren't typical of the Q-Tips. So I had those ideas. Now, when CBS signed me, they didn't know that. So they said, right, first thing we're going to do is we're going to get the ace, the best musicians in the UK for playing soul music, and we'll get the best brass section and da 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 and this sort of stuff. And I said, no, I don't want to do that. And they, and they went, well, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I want to make perfect pop music. And they were saying, like what? And I was saying, you know, like who be within the moonlight by Dollar or something. And they went, what? You want to sound like Dollar? I went, no, <laughs> but that's a perfect pop song. And I want to be able to make one of my own, you know, or some of my own. So then there was a, a restriction put on me where they would have to okay the songs I went into the studio with. But once or twice I did scrap one that I didn't like and then started doing another one and got told off for it. But um, we eventually found our way. The first two singles, Iron Out the Rough Spots and Love of the Common People, didn't make it. And then, of course, you went straight to number one with the cover of the Marvin Gaye B-side, Wherever I Lay My Hat. Marvin's was quite up-tempo, and that was a deliberate ploy on your part to put your own personal stamp on it by slowing it down, right? Yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah. I felt that he was pretty carefree and happy-go-lucky in his song. Once I decided to slow it down a bit, then the lyrics started to take on the form of someone who's been a bit of a Lothario for maybe a bit too long, and he's realising that the glamour's going out of it and he'll, he'll end up with no one. Did you ever hear back from Marvin Gaye's camp before he sadly died about what he thought of wherever I lay my hat? I only heard from his brother, and his brother had come over to a CBS convention, I think, to pick up a posthumous award for the Sexual Healing album. And he said that Marvin really liked my version, yeah. You had romance, did you break it by Love Will Tear Us Apart, an iconic record for Joy Division and their lead singer Ian Curtis. Were you taking a bit of a risk by recording that? We didn't think so at the time, but I'd found an engineer called Laurie Latham who was recommended to us by the drummer that we were, were working with at the time. So we worked on a few tracks and Laurie said, look, you've obviously got lots of R&B songs that you can draw from if you want to. They said, how about if we took a modern song? What would you do with that? So he thought I could do a great version of Love Will Tear Us Apart. So we thought about it for a while and, and I said, what if we did it in the same tempo as Reach Out, I'll Be There by The Four Tops and the same kind of rhythm pattern. And if you listen to that, da, 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 which is what I put underneath the song, that's the same as I'll be there, you know. So that was how it started. When rooting bites hard, and ambition 
Did you ever hear back from Peter Hook or Bernard Sumner about what you thought of your version? I did hear from Peter, yeah. I've met him a couple of times. He's a friend of Arthur Baker, the producer, and he always passes his best to me every time he sees Arthur. I didn't know I was coming in for flack at the time I did it, but then I did. Uh, the kindest thing that happened was when John Peel played both of them, one after the other, which I never thought he'd do, and say, you know, you can like it or you can not like it, but you've got to say that it is an interesting take on a great song, you know. And so I think that calmed the waters a bit. So no parley, when you'd made it, when you'd finished it, did you and CBS think, wow, this is going to do something and do something big? <laughs> I didn't know. I just thought I'd made a good album, but that doesn't mean to say it's going to sell. And I remember Muff Winwood, who signed me, said, hurry up and finish the album, and with a bit of luck it will go silver. <laughs> and so, no, I don't think they did. You were catapulted into, you know, the spotlight big time almost straight away, I think, once you got the number one single. What are your memories of that period, sort of from 1983 to 1986? It was a bit of a whirlwind of successes and the successes. But in my own little way, like I said, going one step at a time, my view of being successful was only limited to the UK because those are the music papers I read and the charts that I saw. And so it exceeded any expectations I may have had the minute it started to go across into Europe and get big there. You know, and, and Germany was one of the biggest selling countries, I think, for No Parley. Come Back in Stay was number one for six weeks, I think, and the album was in the charts for three months. I mean, it was nearly three years over here. So the album had a lot of longevity. You must be so proud of it, 40 years on, and uh, which is the starting point for this tour. Yeah, that was by luck again. We started arranging this tour. I didn't realise that it would be the 40th year, so it marks the album in a really, really nice way because I can tell stories about how it got made. You know, and I've got to say thanks to Ian Cooley, who's sadly left as my keyboard player. He had a home accident, which is a real shame, a couple of years ago. And Laurie Latham, who was an engineer that we took a chance on, and he turned out to be a great producer. Can I play Tender Trap from it, one of the two songs that you and Ian wrote together? Because I think yeah. that's terrific. Yeah, I had Stevie Wonder heavily in mind when I wrote that song. When I wake in the morning time, the only... Tender Trap by Paul Young here on BBC Three Counties Radio, taken from his album No Parlay, the debut number one album from 1983. And you can see Paul out on tour, the Behind the Lens tour. It comes to the Eric Morecambe Centre in Harpenden next Saturday, the 6th of May, and then on Friday, the 19th of May, to the Waterside Theatre in Aylesbury. And then he's coming to Dunstable, Radlett, High Wycombe in uh, the autumn. So... You're going to be combining not just some of the, the solo hits, but also maybe some of those uh, wonderful album tracks that people might not have uh, remembered or never heard before because there's so many of those throughout your solo career, Paul. There are, yeah. I mean, I wouldn't say I was going to play those because there's surprisingly little time. Once you've got five songs in the set at the moment, once you've got five songs, there's so little time to um, talk or anything like that. You know, So it's insightful, that's what I'd say. You supported the likes of um, Bob Marley, the Average White Band, the Jay Giles Band, the Knack, the Who. I think even sure you're going to kind of reminisce about one or two of those memories. Yeah, I was still in the Q-tips for most of those. So we toured with the Who, but they were um, very helpful for us, you know. But we were pretty wild, the Q-tips, and we had a few moments. Poor old bass player, we lost him for a while. He came back, he'd had an accident and he couldn't remember having it. No one knows if he got hit by a car or fell down a cliff or what. But he was in hospital for ages and we had to get the guitar player's brother to come and play bass. Tell me about your songwriting. Yeah, songwriting was something I struggled to do when I was young because I couldn't sit still for long enough. And I, I started <laughs> to enjoy writing come the fourth album, the fifth album. I'd got a good songwriting partner in Drew Barfield. And also I went out and did songwriting in, in Nashville and was lucky enough to get a couple of covers. So I enjoy it a lot more now. And you've got a brand new album coming out very, very soon, right? That's right, yeah. Well, what happened was in lockdown, there wasn't much that I could do. And where I was in lockdown, I had no studio or anything. So I just looked through a lot of projects I'd done and not completed for 
for some reason or another. And also the songs I'd written in Nashville that I'd done demos for my publisher. But when I did the demos in the studio, I still used the same band that I would do in my solo shows. So they were really well played. They just needed a little bit of fairy dust on the top, as the trogs would call it. Mm-hmm. Some strings and some extra parts, you know, to turn them into something nice. And that's what the album is, really, a collection of material that when people thought maybe I wasn't up to much, I was still working. Are you going to squeeze a couple of those in on the live shows? Yeah, we do do that as well, yeah. 14 year solo career, the final hit was I Wish You Love, taken from the Paul Young album. I think that's a really strong record as well, from 1997. The irrepressible and always impressive Paul Young, Luton born and bred, of course, one of Beveridge's most famous sons here on BBC Three Counties Radio. I was talking to Alan Clark of The Hollies last week, who's just released a new solo album at the age of 81, with his longtime friend Graham Nash on backing vocals, who's also 81. You're not in that decade, you're 67. He said in his head he's still 21. Does that ring true with you? Yeah, it does. It's only my body that reminds me sometimes, or not. Uh, but in my head, yeah, I've still got a sense of devilment. <laughs> and how's the voice these days? Yeah, it's doing very well as well, yeah. It's funny, you know, some people's voices, like Tony Bennett's, seem to stay the same. And then another great, like Frank Sinatra, his voice changed over the years. So uh, I think my voice has got a lot more of a chest voice now than a head voice, you know. You don't have to change the keys, though, of the songs. Oh, yeah, yeah. I sang outside of my natural range for most of my career. Yeah. And that was youthfulness that allowed you to do that? Yes, it was, yeah. I mean, I can go right down to, uh, what's his name, from uh, Paint Your Wagon, Lee Lee Marvin. Marvin. I can go right down there if I want to, so, you know. This is a 96-date tour. I know you've got three months off in the summer before you come back in the autumn. I don't know if you're going abroad in that time. Sounds like it's going to be pretty gruelling the next few weeks and months. Yes, it is. Yep, there's all that going on. And uh, I'm going to America in August, so there's very little time. Actually, I come back from the American tour straight back into the book tour. So I've only got June and July. And in those months... We're filling the calendar with Los Pacaminos shows. Flippin' egg! <laughs> <laughs> I know. This is taking you back almost to those heady days in the 80s, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And also the Q-tips, they never stopped working. It was between us and Nine Below Zero, as to who was the hardest working band of like 1978 or something like that, you know. So throughout your amazing career, what do you think is your best song or the song on the recording that you're most proud of Mm. there's one on the final album i did for cbs and i did an album with don was called the crossing and it's a song that i wrote with drew called won't look back well you are looking back but you know in a positive in a fruitful way right now i think yeah really enjoying it paul young has been my special guest the behind the lens tour is commemorating the 40th anniversary of the release of his debut solo album no parlay and he's also released his memoir take a piece of me with you new album out soon see paul on saturday may the 6th at the eric morecambe center in harpenden friday the 19th of may at the waterside theater in aylesbury and then in the autumn saturday the 16th of september at the grove theater here in dunstable sunday the 15th of october at the radlett center in Radlett, and on Sunday the 22nd of October at the Swan Theatre in High Wycombe. Uh, Details of all of those dates and how to book tickets on Paul's own website, www.paul-young.com. Paul-young.com. Thank you so much for your time. Paul, thank you. Really good to speak to you. Great, and thanks. That was a very good interview as well. I'm going to have to go, though, because I'm 10 minutes late on the next one. Take care. appreciate it. What you've done Maybe I can forget it now. From the 1993 solo album by Paul Young, The Crossing, that was Won't Look Back that he co-wrote with Drew Barfield.